Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today it is the 28th of March. Today we're going to be doing a very short frontline update and then I want to talk about this video that was posted by the Ukrainian um, Defense Minister Oleksiy Reznikov. So we're going to analyze that and talk about really the wider implications because I thought it was pretty interesting. Well, let's first talk about some frontline updates. So most notable thing is that the Russians were able to retake the dachas in the western part of the town of Mikilske. So you see here's like the rural area of the town of Mikilske. It was partially under Ukrainian control following a counterattack they conducted about a month ago where they were able to push back the Russian forces from their fort positions that were trying to like probe into Vukhodar and the coal mine. And so the Russians they have now been able to retake this territory over here that I've circled in red because uh, originally the Ukrainians they conducted a counterattack from their positions in Vukhodar and were able to infiltrate some of these dachas but this shows that again Russia has been able to stabilize the front line but it does also indicate that Ukraine does have a very solid line of defense and that any sort of renewed attack in this direction will be extremely difficult especially now that it's it would be the third time that the Russians would be attacking Vukhodar. First time was in November, December, and then again there was another push in late January. And really there's been no success in any of those pushes now. So for the time being, I would expect there just to be sort of a lull in the offensives and the attacks. Just sort of positional fighting for the time being as the front line stabilizes around the town of Mikilska, this town over here. Let's move on to some other parts of the front line. Around Pervomyska, the Russians are making some gradual gains. There's some drone footage confirming that they were able to take over the streets adjacent to this pond over here. And so, really, it is house to house fighting. Much of the town is leveled. Honestly, it's only a few blocks that run sort of like in a certain direction to like the northwest. And so it is a pretty narrow town in that regard, but every single house is being fought over. So it's very difficult to make any sort of advances over here. Any sort of advances through the open terrain is also extremely difficult because of the Ukrainian um, electronic warfare capabilities and the fact that they're really swarming a lot of the airspace with the drones. And that's certainly a factor holding them back. We even have the Birds of Magyar, this air reconnaissance group that was moved into the area around Pervomyska probably in an effort to hold back the advancing Russians after they were forced to leave Solidar. So, if we go to Evdivka, no new gains to report on, but let's go to the situation in Bakhmut. In Bakhmut, really, I have really nothing new to talk about. There's a, another geolocated video over here of a, a Russian journalist near the front line. And so you can see this tag that I have over here, it's extremely close to Mariupolska streets, which is the current line of contact. And so maybe that implies that the fighting has shifted a bit deeper into Ukrainian control territory. I'm not exactly sure of that, but it is certainly a possibility or it just means that the Russian journalist was very close to the front lines. Either way, in the video, I don't really understand Russian, so I can't analyze it that deeply. Although I would be interested in seeing a translation because it was a 10 minute video. But in the video at the end you could see really like a view of the Russian perspective from this kindergarten over here. So they were like standing in the kindergarten and the wall is partially open. It just got destroyed on uh, one of the top floors. So they have a view of the surrounding areas. And so it just gives a glimpse at the fact that First of all, the Wagner Group is still there and conducting assault operations in this district. This is the Sobachivka district, by the way. This entire district that's like around Mariupolska streets. And so in this area, you still have the Wagner Group. And they're still really combing house to house. And a lot of the houses are at least partially destroyed. Uh, uh, some are still standing, surprisingly, and don't have that much damage. And also the roads and all the routes used by like infantry... They aren't that damaged either. There's some debris, obviously, on the sidewalks and stuff like that. But you could still move pretty sizable chunks of like manpower through these roads without much of an issue. So it's not hard to maneuver in that regard. You could also probably move some lighter vehicles through here. 
including civ- civilian vehicles, by the way. But that's really about it in terms of the front line. I want to talk about this post by uh, Alexei Reznikov. So Ukrainian government official, you can see, defense minister. He says here, uh, it was a pleasure to take the first Ukrainian challenger to main battle tank for a spin. Such tanks supplied by the UK have recently arrived in our country. And he's just thinking uh, Rishi Sunak, Benjamin Wallace. And so let's look at this actually because this is pretty interesting. You can see here that the Ukrainians have finally re- received the first shipment of the Challenger 2 main battle tanks from the United Kingdom. And it's not just the main battle tanks that they have received. They've also received some Challenger armored repair and recovery vehicles. And so these would be useful in any sort of battle if the Challenger 2 tanks are damaged or like the tracks get damaged for instance and then they need to be towed off and so that's just a further added bonus in this shipment and these tanks have come relatively quickly and so that may cast a doubt as to the amount of preparedness that the Ukrainian forces have like perhaps they haven't been trained enough to use these in battle as of now in late March but I don't actually think that's the purpose that the um, Ukrainians have in receiving these tanks at the moment. But before I get to what I think they're going to do with these tanks, I want to talk about some of the other tanks that have recently arrived that was uh, announced by Alexei Reznikov. And also you could see over here that he has um, this hat. I'm pretty sure that's the hat of the Ukrainian air assault forces. So that's pretty interesting. I do believe that a lot of these tanks and a lot of these infantry fighting vehicles will be going to those units within the air assault deta- uh, detachments. There are a lot of uh, air mobile units that have been recently formed, and they may be uh, supplemented by these pieces of equipment. And then also, obviously, you have the 4th Tank Brigade, one of the main tank units in Ukraine, operating around the uh, Bakhmut direction. But also, I do believe that they also have a presence around Zvatove. So maybe they're sort of split into two. But they do have several battalions within Bakhmut, and it's in Vyrons, like. You have the 1st, 2nd, 3rd tank battalions. I can't really find them right now, but I know they're around the city of Bakhmut. And so it is interesting in that regard. But let's go here. You can see uh, within the last 24 hours, tons of uh, Western military equipment uh, is confirmed to have arrived in Ukraine. So in terms of Challenger 2s, there are 14. There's 21 Leopard 2A6 main battle tanks. So that's interesting. Then you have 40 Martyr, 1A3 infantry fighting vehicles, 90 Striker armored fighting vehicles and then we don't know the amount of cougar mrap so those are mine resistant ambush protected vehicles but uh there were some in the videos posted by Reznikov, so we know that at least some have arrived from the united states and we know that in late 2022 the united states in their aid package they said that there would be 37 cougars that would be sent in total so that's just like a general estimate of how much will eventually come to ukraine and then in terms of some other tanks that we know should be arriving in the coming months, we know that like Poland, they said they'll give the Ukrainians the PT-91 tanks. And uh, those are called uh, Twardy, I believe. It's Twardy PT-91 tanks. Those are developed from the T-72s. So it's more of like a Soviet-oriented uh, tank as opposed to a lot of these, like the Challengers or the Leopards that are coming from NATO, from the UK, Germany. And then in terms of like the uh, M1, A1 Abrams, there's a 31 that were pledged, right? And they're expected to arrive either like quarter four of 2023 or quarter one of 2024. So that's probably the main battle tank that will take the longest to arrive just for probably logistical reasons and also probably because of the extensive amount of training that is required for the tank crews and for the mechanical specialists before they can use it effectively in battle. But also it's pretty interesting because they, they're giving Ukraine the M1A1 tanks and not the M1A2 tanks. So maybe that's because the United States wants to keep a hold of those tanks for themselves. But uh, let's move on to the other tanks. There is some Leopard 2A4s that have been recently transferred by Norway, Spain, and Poland. So a lot of these were you know, sold by Germany and then they gave them permission to give it to Ukraine. And then interestingly, there were Ukrainian tankers that were trained in Spain, in Zaragoza. And 
there's footage that was posted of them. There was like 40 tank crews involved in that. And there were 15 mechanical specialists that were trained. And all of those individuals, all of those soldiers were for the 4th Tank Brigade. And they were all trained in Spain. You know, NATO country with experience with these tanks. Specifically the Leopard 2A4s. And so it is pretty interesting. Specifically that they came from the 4th Tank Brigade. Because that is situated around Bakhmut. Now I'm not implying that there's going to be a counterattack around Bakhmut. I'm actually very skeptical of that. Because I don't know if Ukraine has the proper amount of manpower and not just the proper amount but this sort of force that can actually conduct offensive activity not just territorial defense units not just mobilized and conscripted individuals who are just sent to the front line in me grinders to hold the line for as long as possible but actual forces that are highly trained uh, highly experienced that could actually push through and break through the russian lines i doubt that ukraine has the proper amount of forces in this area to conduct that sort of operation successfully against not only the wagner group but also against the russian airborne forces like you have a lot of these different units that i've mapped out over here you can look through and so i guess the general idea would be that the ukrainians will launch some sort of pincer operation where like from one direction like from here they attack from uh like vesele towards soledar and then they attack from the um, northern flank of Bakhmut, like around Komove, and then try to like isolate the Russian garrisons in Krasnohora, Paraskovivka, because now you have like a lot of these makeshift command centers that were set up in these towns to help further like coordinate the fighting near the front line. So a lot of the local officers and stuff, they may be isolated in this area in such an attack and they may have to surrender. But again, this is purely speculation, and there's really little indication that this is even possible in the near future. The only really like indication that I've seen is that Prigozhin, he's released a video recently where he was talking about Ukrainian capabilities around Bakhmut, and he said that there's about 80,000 Ukrainian forces in this general area around Donbass. He didn't specifically say Bakhmut, but he said around Donbass, and that they are being supplied by the West. We know that, obviously, and that they're preparing to assault the Wagner Group's positions and reconquer the territory that they have lost. So what I'm saying, like those 80,000, they're probably dispersed around like Saviansk, Kramatorsk, Druskivka, Kosentinivka, Chasifyar, Bakhmut, all these different towns. And so they're not obviously concentrated in one specific area, but they are just like widely distributed across the entire front in Donbass. And who knows, maybe those forces together could have some sort of offensive capability. But at the moment, we're still seeing the Wagner group advance incrementally, not on the flanks anymore, but within the city center. So it would be a major change in um, pace, and it would be a major turnaround if Ukraine could conduct a counterattack in Bakhmut. But what I think is more likely with all of these shipments of tanks and the creation of new units, by the way, because let's look over here. We have new units that were created, and I've talked about them before. A few of these units, I might add some more because I think there are some others that Ukraine created. And these were formed or reorganized in early 2023, like January, February. And some of them, you know, they were battalions originally, and then they were sort of like reorganized into brigades. History Legends has a video we just released talking about this. I'll link it in the description because it's very good and just goes more in depth about this entire situation. But you do have undoubtedly new units. And some of them have some pretty interesting specializations, like this uh, 13th Jaeger Brigade specializes in warfare and forested areas. And so most of them are stationed around big Ukrainian cities in the north, like uh, Zhitomir, Kiev, Bilatserkva. But what I believe is happening is that Ukraine is building up a new strike force in that they're going to use the accumulation of Western infantry fighting vehicles and armored personnel carriers and tanks. And they're going to specifically train these units and other air assault units with these uh, tanks and with these vehicles from the West and from NATO in order to sort of create this new Western style military as the Soviet or older style military in Ukraine is dying in the Donbass. And so you can see they're sort of like bleeding out right now in Donbass and these new shipments of tanks, they will help free up a lot of the Soviet equipment as a 
OSI and T Defender here points out, he says that like a lot of the Ukrainian tanks, like the T-64, C-72, C-80s, could now be moved to the front line because in reserves you have the NATO tanks. And you want to keep them in reserve for any sort of future operation. And because most Ukrainian forces don't have any sort of experience or training with those tanks, so you first want to train them in that. Meanwhile, most of the Ukrainian uh, tank crews obviously have experience with the Soviet tanks, such as T-72s, T-80s, T-64s, T-62s, whatever. And so now that they're being freed up, those tanks specifically could be moved to the front line in Donbass and used to either conduct an active defense or just you know hold the line against the Wagner Group and the Russian airborne forces assaults. So that's the logic, and I find that argument to be very convincing. And then in the long term, obviously building the strike force we could talk about where those Ukrainian units could be moved into, whether it would be Kherson, which I see as uh, less likely, or maybe around Zaporozhye, where we have expected a Ukrainian assault for a while now. So as the Russians, they've built numerous fortifications in this direction to sort of prevent sort of repeats of the disaster in Kharkiv. And again, History Legend, he talks about this a lot in his video, so... I recommend watching that if you want to get a better idea of the entire situation. But yeah, that's basically it. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys.